Hang on. Was I not on? <laughs> I will get my own back. <clears throat> As I say, you've probably heard some of these questions yourselves. Uh, here's a good example. If the Bible's true and we all descended from Adam and Eve, where did Cain's wife come from? Well, here's another one for you. Oh, no, we're not going to have problems. Ah, right, there you go. What about dinosaurs? We're told that there was a great age of dinosaurs in the past. I mean, how come they're not mentioned in Scripture? Uh, and then there's, there's this one, which um, is an unusual one. It's what, not one I usually mention, but I've been asked to talk about it today. If the universe is only 6,000 years old, how can we see stars that are billions of light years away? And then there's the number one question we get asked about the goodness of God. God is a God of love. Why does he allow so much death and suffering in this world? Can I get a show of hands here? Is there anybody in this audience who's heard questions like this? Put your hand up and now hold it up there. And I want you to have a quick look around because you're not the only one, okay? Um, people, I only ask four questions. People have dozens of questions like this, questions that are an intellectual stumbling block to them believing the truth claims of the Bible. And you know what? We have answers to all of these questions. At Creations Ministries, we like to refer to ourselves as an information ministry. And what do we do as an information ministry? We produce information. When you came in, you would have seen the books and, and DVDs on the table back there. Can I get one thing out of the way very quickly here? I'm not here to sell you books today, okay? Um, that's not how our ministry works. We're actually a, a donation-funded ministry. Mums and dads around the country and around the world support us on a regular basis, and that allows us to come to churches and present a message like this, but it also allows us to do scientific research and, and then produce these resources to put into your hands for two reasons. Firstly, to encourage you in your own faith. I want you to understand that real science properly interpreted does not conflict with the biblical account, okay? And secondly, to encourage you in sharing your faith. I want you out there in the world boldly witnessing to your family and friends, um, confident in the knowledge that the Bible can be trusted. Now, one of the best sources of information we have is our website. Um, and I'm very biased, obviously, but this is an amazing website. It now has more than 15,000 fully searchable articles on this topic, written by our scientists and professionals. And a new article is added almost every single day. Uh, let's say you're watching a nature documentary on TV, you know, David Attenborough, and, and he'll say something like, uh, that carbon dating proves that the earth is billions of years old. If you get something like that, you don't understand it, you don't have an answer for it, just go to creation.com and type the question into the search engine and all these answers will come up for you. And the great thing about creation.com is that all the information there is absolutely free. We also have a free email alert newsletter. It's called Infobytes, and it's delivered to your inbox every one or two weeks, and it's designed to keep you up to date with important breaking news in this whole debate. And it provides biblically sound and scientifically, scientifically sound answers um, to these questions. All you need is an email address, and if you have an email address, I would strongly recommend that you sign up for Infobytes. We're not going to spam you. Um, and you can always unsubscribe at a later date if you decide that it's not for you. When I came in, I decided to choose the best looking bloke in the whole place to assist me in handing these things out. Some of you might think that my eyesight is getting poor. <laughs> so he's going to hand out sign up sheets for Infobytes. All you have to do when it arrives is jot your name, your contact details, and your email address in the spaces provided. Oh dear. Uh, yep, okay. Um, and when you're done, please pass it on so the next person gets a chance. Now, while those are going around, I want to give you an example of how you can use this in evangelism. You guys remember, oh, now it's jumping too far. There you go. You guys remember this bloke, Steve Irwin. When he was killed by that stingray, our website was flooded with questions from skeptics saying, aha, why did God design stingrays that kill people? So what would you do if somebody asked you a question like that? Well, what we did is we um, put a, um, 
an, answer, um, an article together on our website. It's called The Stingray of Death. We then, through our Infobytes, we sent out a link to that article. And people like you then shared that link with their family and friends. And within 10 days, this became the most visited article on our website. Why? Because it was, it was topical and we provided answers for people. Okay, I've titled to talk, to my talk today, Genesis, Foundations for Truth in a Post-Truth World. Why post-truth? Well, every year, I don't know if you know this, but the Oxford English Dictionary has a word of the year. And in 2016, the word of the year was post-truth. It apparently describes a situation where personal beliefs are more important in shaping public opinion than objective facts. Uh, and I believe nowhere is this more um, obvious than in the creation evolution debate. You see, there's a misconception that this is a battle between science and religion, but it's not. It's a battle of worldviews. Our worldview is like a set of glasses that all of us put on to try and work out or try and explain the world around us. Basically, our worldview provides answers to the three big questions of life. Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? What happens when I die? Now, many people today have decided that we're just the result of a huge number of unlikely events. 13.8 billion years ago, there was a big bang. And since that time, um, since then, time and chance have produced everything, including you and me. When we die, that's it. We're dead. There is no afterlife. Can you see that if those are your answers to questions one and three, we've come from nothing, we're going to nothing, what's the logical answer to question two? We can have no purpose. There is no reason for us to be, we're just an accident. Ultimately, there are no consequences. We can do what feels right. But you see, if God is true, I'm sorry, if the Bible is true, God is our creator. You and I were created with meaning and purpose in his image. And the decisions we make in this life affect where we spend eternity. Can you see that the answers we people give to questions two and three will always be determined by how they answer question one. Where did I come from? And there are only two games in town. It's either creation or it's evolution. So I, to show you what I, mean, what I mean by this, I've pictured this, uh, this battle of worldviews as two trees. Interestingly, Jesus talk, talked a lot about trees. Trees produ produce fruit according to their nature. And I've labeled the left-hand tree humanism. What's humanism? Human, humanism means that man is the ultimate authority in the world. We can make up our own rules about life. There is no God, no creator to be accountable to. Now, if you subscribe, uh, so how do people justify this worldview? Well, the pillar that this whole thing is built on is evolution. And if you subscribe to this belief system, what type of fruit will be pr produced? You'll get racism. You'll get abortion. You know, three years ago, New Zealand introduced the most radical abortion laws in the Western world. Euthanasia is now legal in this country. And, uh, and then you've got this, oh, so marriage has been redefined. And then you get this new one, this one that's just started to hit us, this trans, transgender issue. These are the problems we seem to be facing as a church today. But can I suggest that these are not actually the problems? You see, they are the symptoms of, they are the fruit of an underlying problem, which is humanism with this pillar of evolution. But now compare this to the tree on the right, the tree of Christianity. Everything we need to know about the Christian faith, the nature of God, our need for salvation. Where do we get this from? We get it from the Bible. See, the Bible is a history book telling us what God created and what went wrong and why we need to be saved. Most of our church doctrine today, uh, our New Testament doctrine, 
comes from the fact that the New Testament writers believe that the Old Testament, the creation account in Genesis, records real history. Over a hundred times the New Testament authors refer back to Genesis as real history. Jesus himself refers to Genesis on 16 occasions. He refers to it as, um, he refers to a real Adam and a real flood. Now, if we subscribe to this, if we subscribe to this as our worldview, if we believe that God is our creator, what sort of fruit will be produced? We'll believe in the sanctity of life. Oh, come on, there you go. The sanctity of life. Um, abortion and euthanasia are wrong. Human beings are made in the image of a loving God. We are made male and female. We'll love our neighbor as ourselves because we are all children of God. Now, I want to make a very key point here, okay? Most people believe in evolution because it's all they've ever been taught. Many of my colleagues at Creation Ministries are former evolutionists because that's all that they were ever taught at school and at university. And in our schools and in our universities, uh, young ch uh, your children and your grandchildren are going to be taught that evolution is a fact. See, if we know this in advance, surely we should be doing more at home and in the church to counter this anti-biblical narrative. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If God is not the creator, where does the truth begin in Scripture? In the New Testament? But I've just said that the New Testament refers back to the Old Testament. Beliefs about where we come from ultimately affect our worldview. Now, I'm going to have to give you some bad news before I get into the good news. There is good news coming, okay? But I do have to give you some bad news. I'm struggling a little bit here, guys. Of it. Okay, good. Barna Research is a Christian research organization in the US. Uh, they've been surveying the church for many years, and their findings are actually relevant worldwide. Barna carried out a confidential survey of Christian teens in America. These were Christian young people sitting in church pews, and they were told they could answer confidentially. These young people revealed that only one in three of them intended to continue to attend church once they left home. This is a shocking statistic. Intellectually, two-thirds of them were, uh, were gone once they had the opportunity. Now, the statistics in New Zealand, I would suggest, would be very, very similar, if not worse. You see, we, we see our young people attending church. They go to the youth group, and we, we think we've got them for life. Now, I'm going to show you a little bit more about this later. Um, but before I get into this, I, I want to lighten it up just a little bit. Okay. Oh, here we go. Good. Um, here's some students talking. And one says to you, uh, you seem a bit down. That science class of yours went for ages. What happened? Well, teacher said, we're nothing special. We came from pond scum. We're just evolved apes. Come on, you can do it. I, well, you know what? I'll put my hand up like that. Is that all right? OK. Oh, you've, done, you've gone too fast now. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, so what are, they, but what are they teaching in your next class? Self-esteem. I got there in the end. Many a true word has been spoken in jest. You know what, if we teach our children that they've come from nothing, that they're going to nothing, that they're just evolved animals, why would we expect people to behave any differently? What are you, uh, so what are we going to do about the science? Because yes, I know you, you're listening to me. I'm here to talk about science uh, and you want to believe me. So what, what can we get from the science? It's interesting because that word science, when people hear it, um, we, we, we think about the science that brings us things like laptops and cell phones. Science has put men on the moon, but actually, this is a very well-defined area of science called operational or experimental science. Operational science deals with experiments. Uh, these experiments are performed in the present. They are observable, they're repeatable, they are testable. Technology advances by building on these experiments over time.
now I'm having problems with my end. <laughs> That's interesting. Okay. But there are different, there's a different kind of science. Science that studies events that allegedly happened in history. For example, did dinosaurs uh, evolve into birds 65 million years ago? Did this happen in the present? No, it didn't. Did anyone see it happen? No, so it's not observable. Can we repeat it? Can we test it? See, these are one-time only events, and they're not repeatable. Now, we're told evolution is science, but ultimately, it's not. Uh, some Christians like to say that oh, evolution is just a theory, but this is a bad argument because for scientists, a theory has good uh, experimental support. For instance, the theory of gravity. See, I can drop something and I catch it. Sometimes I don't. Um, and I can repeat it over and over again. Okay, gravity works. But evolution is less than a scientific theory. It's actually a belief system, a worldview, a philosophy that's um, about the past that's used to explain what we see today. Interestingly, when we talk to, science, to skeptics about our faith, often it's not evolution that they start talking to us about. It's the age of the earth. The reason for that is the theory of evolution requires gradual change over long periods of time. So an old earth is essential for evolution. And in particular, we're told that the rocks and the fossils prove that the earth is billions of years old. What most people don't realize is that this whole idea originated with the rocks and fossils, this idea that the earth is old. Most people are familiar with the geologic column, yes? See behind me here with things like the Triassic and the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, the age of dinosaurs and so on. Millions of years of Earth history are supposedly represented by these eras of rock recorded in the strata. And fossils in these rocks supposedly record the sequence of biological evolution over time. So what are the scientific facts? Well, we find billions of dead things, we call them fossils, buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the Earth. Today we see sediments being laid down very slowly. And if we assume that this rate has happened throughout history, and we do the calculations, strata like this would have taken hundreds of millions of years to form. This is called uniformitarianism. The, the present is the key to the past. Processes we see happening today have supposedly happened throughout history. But if we put on our biblical worldview glasses, can anybody think of an event in history which would have caused sedimentary rocks to be created all over the earth and billions and billions of dead things in those rocks? The flood of Noah. You know what? How long did the flood last? One year was the total flood. 40 days, 40 nights was the waters, the rains, but it lasted one year, okay? If the flood of Noah lasted one year, where did all the millions of years go? If all of these geological strata were created in one year, there is no millions of years. And no millions of years means there's no time for evolution. This is why evolutionists are so dogmatic about the idea that the earth is old. And it's why we creationists cling so tightly to a young age for the earth. So what can we learn from the facts? Well, we're going to start by looking at the Grand Canyon because it's an icon of long age beliefs. In the can canyon, we see alternating bands of light and dark rocks called strata. And in these strata, we often find very thin layers, only millimeters thick. These are sedimentary layers laid down by water or by wind. And one layer, we are told, supposedly records one year. Now in the Grand Canyon, there are hundreds of millions of these layers. So long ages assume that they're looking at hundreds of millions of years of Earth history. And then once these layers are formed, the Colorado River supposedly uh, eroded the canyon over tens of millions of years. And again, if we measure the current rates of erosion and, and do the calculations, then you can see where they get the millions of years from. But what does real operational science tell us? In Washington state in 1980, there was a volcanic eruption. You might remember it as the Mount St. Helens eruption. Scientists knew it was going to erupt. 
they, the mountain was venting at the top and there were swarms and swarms of earthquakes. When it finally happened, the mountain didn't blow its top, it blew its side. One third of the volcano erupted. Lumps of rock the size of a city block were thrown as much as 10 kilometers from the mountain. But the fascinating thing is that we know that this was just a small event compared to some of the things that have happened in the past. In the aftermath of the eruption, bands of strata were discovered. Very similar to what's found in the Grand Canyon, but on a smaller scale. And you can see I've put a person in here just to give you an idea of, of the height. Um, this band, this section was about 30 meters thick. Now, in this section here, you can see that there are three distinct bands. And if we take a closer look at the middle band, scientists found laminations. Thin layers had formed as the sediments were laid down. In the middle band I highlighted, there are thousands of these layers. Now, the uniformitarian interpretation would tell us that one of these layers was laid down in a year. So we're looking at thousands of years uh, for this to form. But it didn't. This middle band was formed on the 12th of June, 1980, in just three hours. We also have dates for the other layers as well. All of them were laid down by catastrophic processes in a very short time. And around Mount St. Helens today, there are canyons everywhere. This one's called the Little Grand Canyon. It's 1 40th the size of the Grand Canyon. The side walls are up to 40 meters high, and it's as much as 45 meters wide. Today, there's a small river running through the canyon, and the, the uniformitarian interpretation would tell us that that river ebbed and flowed over a long period of time to form the canyon. So what are the facts? This canyon was actually formed in less than 24 hours by a giant mud flow. The river did not create the canyon. The canyon formed and the river followed the course. So you can see we, from experimental science, we can see that it doesn't take millions of years for sedimentary layers and canyons to form. But surely, surely it takes a long time to turn wet, soft sediment into solid rock. Actually, no. One of our supporters was walking along a beach in Australia and they found this rock on the beach and it looked very similar to all the other rocks. Did it take millions of years to form? I'll let you decide. They turned the rock over and they found this, a toy car. Are toy cars millions of years old? No. And remember, the rock can only be the same age as, as, as the car, at, at, at the most. In fact, it's younger than the car. By the way, the information I'm sharing today, it's not rocket science, guys. Um, as you go through my talk, you'll see these little pictures of magazine covers uh, in the, the corners of some of the pictures. Um, most of what I'm covering actually comes from a magazine we produce called Creation Magazine. This magazine is probably the most valuable resource that we have because it's so easy to share the information with others. Okay, so let's move on and let's talk about the fossils. According to the long age view, a living order organism dies in water it sinks to the bottom, and then it lies on the bottom while it's slowly covered up with sediment. And then once covered, the fossilization process begins, and then it's buried under layers of sediment, supposedly representing millions of years. But is this, is this reasonable? Does anybody here have a fish tank? Oh, I, I don't believe, oh yes, we've got one down here. Oh, it's a terrible question to ask you, but what happens when one of the fish dies? Does it sink to the bottom? It doesn't. Exactly. Things when they, organisms that, that when they die in water, they don't sink to the bottom, they bloat and they float to the top. So the very start of this process is wrong. Yep. This is a school of fish that died in the Darling River uh, in Australia. Dead organisms in water don't sink. They will usually bloat and float. Then what happens? Once they're on the surface, what happens to them? Scavengers take, take over, don't they? And they pull the whole thing to pieces. This, this, these fish didn't last long on the surface. And then what's left sinks to the bottom, but does it just lie there for thousands of years while it's gradually covered up? 
Of course not. Other scavengers get involved and then microorganisms become part of the process and they, the whole thing disintegrates completely. I have to ask, would this result in the beautifully preserved fossils we find today? Fossilization actually requires rapid burial. A lot of sediment in a short space of time, either immediately after death or causing the death of the organism. Uh, then only this type of rapid burial will seal the organism from scavengers and decay so that fossilization can take place. And you know what? We find some amazing examples that can only be the result of this type of rapid burial. This is a picture of a female ichthyosaur. I might have shown it to you last time I was here. It's a female ichthyosaur. Amazing things. They were an extinct sea creature, sort of like a dolphin, but different. They were three to six meters long. Can anybody tell me how we know that it's a female? Is it? Okay, you guys, you have heard this before, yes? It's giving birth. Now, ladies, I know that labor can take a long period of time, <laughs> but it doesn't usually take thousands or millions of years, does it? And here's another one of a fish fossilized in the process of swallowing its lunch. These are instants in time that have been recorded in the fossil record. Okay, so now we know that we need rapid burial to start the fossilization process, but surely, you know, we're taught at school, everybody knows it takes long periods of time to actually turn something into a fossil. Well, actually, no, under the right conditions, fossilization can happen very rapidly. This is a soft felt miner's hat that was actually buried by the Tarawera eruption in 1886. It was found 20 years later, and this hat and other far artifacts um, had actually turned to solid rock in less than 20 years. You could say that the soft hat has evolved into a hard hat. All that's needed is the right set of conditions and fossilization can happen very rapidly. Okay, actually, we're getting quite good at this. Oh, don't, don't, no, that's, <laughs> we're actually getting quite good at this, so yes. These observational scientific facts that, I, uh, that we've looked at, and there are many, many more that I don't have time to go into today, um, they're absolutely consistent with the biblical timeline. Real science supports the biblical account of creation. But now, now I wanna move on to the theological implications of this debate. See, the idea that the Earth is millions of years old is actually a relatively new idea. It was first proposed seriously about 200 years ago. So how did the church 200 years ago respond to this long age evolutionary attack on scripture? I'd like to say that the church stood firm on the Bible and refuted this science, but that's not what happened. Sadly, many theologians at the time were convinced by this new interpretation of the scientific facts. Uh, interestingly, it was many of the scientists at the time, uh, particularly the geologists, who were um, dismissive of the long, age, uh, uh, long ages and evolution. But for these theologians, science had proved a plain historical reading of Genesis to be wrong. They decided that they had to rescue the rest of the Bible. And the easiest way to do that was to reinterpret Genesis. As a result, and since that time, there have been many different rescuing mechanisms that have been proposed to try and make the Bible conform to science. There's things like theistic evolution. There's progressive creation, there's the day age theory, the gap theory, and there are many, many more. Now, I'm not gonna give any of these ideas the light of day today. I'm not gonna go into the details of them, but I can tell you one, oh, no. <laughs> I've gotta put my hands by my side because otherwise he's gonna change them. <laughs> um, they, these are all attempts to reinterpret the six days of creation. Some try to incorporate evolution, some don't, but they're all attempts to add millions of years into Genesis. They are all different, okay? And logically, they can't all be true. Only one interpretation can be the true interpretation. Supporters of one theory are very quick to point out all the problems with all the other interpretations, and there are problems with all the other interpretations, but they studiously ignore all the problems with their own interpretation. However, there is one major problem common to all of these interpretations, and it has profound implications for the gospel message. At the end of each day of creation, God saw, uh, declared what he saw to be 
Good, yes, and it was good, and it was good. And then at the end of day six, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. In Hebrew, this is tov miod. It means uh, perfection, it means completed, it means finished. Any interpretation that allows for millions of years, whether it's long days, whether it's gap between the days, whether it includes or excludes evolution, uh, is putting millions of years before Adam and Eve. And where does the, the idea of millions of years come from? From the rocks and the fossils, which means the Garden of Eden must have been sitting on top of layers of rock containing fossils, recording millions of years of suffering, disease, and death. And apparently God declared this to be very good. Can you see the theological problem here? Is death good? No, it's not. Death stinks. Death is an intrusion into God's perfect world. Death is an enemy. The Bible tells us that it is the last enemy to be destroyed. When we see bad things happening, maybe um, a, a, a loved one dies of cancer, or thousands of people are killed by a tsunami. This should remind us that something is very wrong with creation. It was Adam's sin that brought death and suffering into the world. There are over a hundred New Testament references to this fact. In Romans 5 verse 12, Paul refers back to Genesis. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. Now, I want to make an important point here. I'm not saying that you can't be a Christian if you believe in evolution in millions of years, okay? That's not the case. We are saved by grace through faith. But even if you don't believe in evolution, if you add millions of years to the Bible, the millions of years come from the rock layers. The rock layers have fossils in them. The fossils are dead things. The result is death before the fall in Genesis. And it is a gospel issue. Should we take Genesis literally? It's been put very succinctly in this simple but profound piece of writing. If Genesis is not literal, his, literal history, with a literal very good creation, with a literal Adam and Eve, then sin did not literally enter the world through their actions. And we have a problem because you and I don't literally need to be saved from anything. We are saved because of, of events that happened in history, events that happened in real space and time. People are not stupid. When we tell the world that Genesis can have multiple different interpretations, the world justifiably concludes that Christianity is no different to all those other religions. And we've just created another question that we can't answer because we have no basis for claiming that Christianity is true. And our young people are not stupid either. Remember the survey I told you about earlier? Well, um, that young people are, are leaving the church. At CMI, we decided to take this research a little bit further. We decided to try and identify why young people were leaving the church. Uh, we sent a film crew onto a university campus or onto university campuses in Atlanta in the States. Uh, <laughs> Atlanta is part of America's Bible Belt. Apparently, there are more churches in the Atlanta region than in the whole of Australia. Okay, this is the Bible Belt. Uh, and we've um, recorded this in a documentary film that we produced called Fallout. As the students walk past, we ask them four questions. Firstly, were you raised in the church? If they said no, we let them go. We only wanted to talk to those who'd been raised in Christian homes. Uh, we ended up with a sample of approximately 100 young people who answered yes to this question. We then asked, creation or evolution, which is true? Of the 100 students, only five believed in biblical creation. The rest said evolution. These were kids raised in Christian homes. We then asked, did your pastors or your parents or anyone show you that uh, any evidence that biblical, biblical creation might be true? All five who still believed in biblical creation had been shown information. Every one of the students who believed in evolution had never been shown any information at all. A lot of them actually laughed. They said, what information? 
There is no information. And the last question, are you still attending church? Of the kids who believed in evolution, just one still attended church. We've left them in the documentary to show that we haven't fudged the results. Now, I'm sure you can see that the number no longer attending church is a lot higher than the 66% that were in the Barna survey, right? But it makes sense, really, doesn't it? Because once they've left home, is the attack on their faith going to get uh, easier or is it going to get harder? Is it going to be more difficult for them to retain their faith? Of course, it's going to get more difficult. But here's the good news. I finally got to the good news. Of the five, of the five who were equipped with information, all of them, all five of them still faithfully attended church. So the creation evolution issue is the major issue facing the church today. As you can see, information on this topic really does make a difference. But it's not just for people who already have faith. Information changes lives, and I know because it changed mine. See, I was raised in a Christian home, but my family never really took the Bible seriously. In fact, my mother was a, a, a science teacher, and she taught and believed in evolution and, and millions of years. So when I left home and went to university and decided I wanted to live my life according to my own rules, as so many young people do, I found it very easy to abandon my faith. And that's what I did. And I lived for 20 odd years as an atheist. Today I'm a biblical creationist. Why? Because somebody took the time to share information with me. Information that convinced me that the Genesis account of creation can be trusted. See, information on this topic is vital for the um, church to be able to communicate the relevance of the Christian message to this world. Ladies and gentlemen, information really does change lives, which is why our focus at CMI is on information. Um, this starts with our website. The lead article ever, um, changes almost every single day, and uh, there's a search engine to help people find the answers to the questions that they want. And can anybody remember what the web address is? Thank you. Now you've said it out loud, you're going to be you're more likely to remember it, okay? We also have um, two full-time information officers. One of them is based in Hastings, actually. And we get thousands of questions on our website, skeptical questions, and every single one of them is answered. We provide answers to people. Probably our best resource is Creation Magazine. Um, does anybody here get this magazine? Thank you, you guys are our salespeople. <laughs> Please go around and tell everybody else how great this magazine is. It's been going now for 40 odd years. It's a glossy magazine with high quality pictures. There's no paid advertising and there's a brilliant children's section as well. When people read it, they're often hit with information that they've never heard before. Remember, most people believe in evolution because it's all they've ever been taught. Information changes lives. And I know because it changed mine, but don't just take my word for it. Um, this is a testimony from a young man by the name of Freddie. Your work was very important for me in becoming a faithful believer in the Bible. I was an atheist convinced of evolution until a year ago, and I started to listen to those crazy young earth believers trying to disprove them. And here I am now, praise the Lord. In a moment, my volunteer, my good looking volunteer is going to hand round sign up sheets for the, the magazine. But before he does, I wanna tell you about a couple of special offers that we only have at events like this. If you sign up today, you get the print edition, but you also get the digital edition as well. This is good for five, devi five devices. So your, your aunts, your uncles, your nieces, your nephews, they can have it on their phone or on their tablet. So you get that for free. Um, and also, if you subscribe for one year, we start by giving you a back issue for free as well. Um, so you, you can start reading straight away. And if you sign up for two years, you get the back issue, plus um, we give you two free DVDs. One's called One Human Family. This is a talk by a guy by the name of Carl Wieland, who's an expert in race and culture. It's a brilliant, brilliant talk on that particular topic. And the second DVD we give you free of charge is that Fallout DVD I told you about earlier. So I'm gonna get my assistant to come to the front. <laughs> Some people you give instructions to and it doesn't quite work out. <laughs> oh, thank you. 
No, no, that's good. I didn't even see you move. <laughs> it obviously moves very quickly. Okay, guys, if, if, th this magazine is, is an incredible resource. You know what? I'll tell you this story. I wasn't going to tell you this story, but I will tell you this story. I was flying back from Brisbane to Auckland, okay? And I was sitting in a seat next to an Indian gentleman, and beside him was his eight-year-old son. And as I was flying, as we were flying, I pulled out a magazine like I do, and I was just reading it. And then uh, just before we landed, I turned to this gentleman. I said, I think your son might like this magazine. And I handed it to him. And being the good father that he was, he opened it up and he went through every single page, right, to make sure that it was something that his son could have, okay? And he turned to a page which had a picture of a liger on it. And the little boy had been watching over his shoulder. And when he saw the liger, he, he got really excited. And he said to his dad, 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 that's a cross between a lion and a tiger. And that does happen. Lions and tigers can have offspring. And then this eight-year-old boy started to explain to his dad about hybridization, and he used the word hybridization. Needless to say, he got that magazine, okay? And the amazing thing was, I got this picture in my mind to this day. As we were walking down the aisles out of the plane, he turned around and he gave me this great big smile. And you know, every time I tell that story, it's like I'm praying for that young man. Because he knew about hybridization, he knew about ligers, but there was a whole heap more Bible-affirming information in that magazine that he took away with him that day. And I just pray always that it has influenced his life. Okay. Can we move on? Oh, yep, yep, keep going through that. Yep, we've done that. <laughs> okay. When I was um, talking to your pastor about this, he said, oh, can you please talk about how we can see distant starlight if the uh, universe is only 6,000 years old? And I thought, oh, there's a challenge because this is not an easy thing to explain. But I thought, I'll see what I can do. So I put together some slides and I, I want to talk about this. Um, it's not easy to explain. So if there's any physicists out there, please understand that I'm giving a very simple interpretation for two reasons. One, so that you guys can understand it, but also because I can understand it as well, okay? First thing you need to know is that the um, Big Bang Theory has exactly the same problem, all right? The Big Bang Theory tells us that um, there was a Big Bang and then uh, over the course of 13 billion years, um, the uh, universe has got to the size that it is today, okay? Um, one of the, the predictions of the Big Bang was that we would see this afterglow of the Big Bang coming at us from all directions. It's called, the, they, they did find this, it's called the cosmic microwave background radiation. And they predicted that it would be a, a, over a range of temperatures. And they found this afterglow and there was this huge announcement that they found proof of the Big Bang. The problem was that rather than being a range of temperatures, it's pretty much one temperature in all directions, which is not what they expected. In fact, this is actually proof that the Big Bang Theory at the time was wrong. Because the only way you could get temperatures from one side of the, uh, um, of the universe to the other to be the same is if there had been a, an exchange of heat. And, and the universe is too big for 13.8 billion years to have given that exchange of heat. So what did they do? They didn't abandon the Big Bang Theory. They never do. What they did is they introduced something called cosmic inflation. And apparently in the first milliseconds of the universe be being created, it expanded hugely. Can you see how it's got very, very big in a very short space of time? And this is called cosmic inflation. And it rescued the Big Bang yet again, okay? Um, the interesting thing is they've got no idea how it started. They've got no idea why it stopped. And while it was happening, gravity had to operate in reverse. <laughs> but they say they've rescued the Big Bang. Okay? Now, there's lots of different theories that have... Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay, yeah, leave it there. There's lots of different theories that have been proposed by creationists to explain how we can see light from stars that are billions of year, light years away. You've got to understand that a light year is a measure of distance. It's the, the amount of distance that light travels in a year. So if, if a star is billions of light years away, that means that that light has been traveling for billions of years to get, a, get to us. How can that be possible in a universe that is only 6,000 years old? That's the question, okay? 
And probably there's, there's lots of different theories. The one I like the best um, is, is called time dilation. Now, we tend to think that time ticks the same wherever we are. It just ticks at the same rate. But this is not the case. We know from experimentation that time is affected by mass, by gravitation. Okay, And we know this because we have satellites that circle, circle the Earth for our GPS, right? And they have clocks on them. They need to have clocks on them. And the clocks up in, uh, on those satellites actually tick faster than the clocks down here. This is amazing. So the more mass you have, the, the slower time will tick. And if you imagine time, and this is a two-dimensional picture of a four-dimensional problem, but if you can imagine that time is like a checkerboard, you put mass into it and it sinks down and that's how the time slows down. This is called time dilation, okay? Very amazing, this is why I don't often talk about it in churches. But um, there is a very good theory being put together by a guy named, by the name of Russell Humphreys, and we've got the DVD down the back there. So let's see if I can explain this one for you. If we're to imagine time as being just flat completely, okay? Um, so we're looking at this whole thing side on, which is ridiculous, but that's what we're doing, okay? There is actually a point where there is so much mass that time would stop completely. This is what big, big um, black holes are, okay? There's so much mass there that the light can't get out and time stops completely. It's called the event horizon. And anything below the event horizon, to people outside, it would look like time had stopped. To people who were there in that area, time would just be ticking along as they would normally experience. I mean, it's mind-blowing, I know. Um, Okay, so if you want to imagine the Earth on this little trampoline almost, so it's got this little dent, okay? But what happened on day four of creation? Can you guys remember? Yes, the sun, the moon, and then there's this little, this little, little side bit that says, and he created the stars as well. So all of a sudden, a huge amount of matter was introduced into the universe. And anything towards the center of the universe would drop below the event horizon. So time would basically, from people from outside looking in, it would look like time had stopped completely on Earth. The ticking had stopped completely. But for people on Earth, it would just be like normal. Okay. Um, so then what happened? Um, the Bible tells us, Oh, and then, sorry, and while this is happening, light would be coming in from the outside edges of the universe. Okay, so light's coming in from everything from the outside edge of the universe. It's coming in. It's coming in at, the li at light speed, obviously, but the, the clocks on Earth have stopped. So this light can keep traveling and traveling and traveling and traveling, but there is, from outside, there seems to be no time passing on Earth. And then the Bible tells us in Isaiah, who stretched out the heavens like a curtain? It's referring to God here. So God actually stretched out the universe. And if you, if you imagine, if you've got a blanket and somebody is in the middle of it and you stretch it out, what's the last part that's going to come up? The middle. The middle will come up last. So as God is stretching out the heavens, the earth in the middle of the universe is slowly coming up until eventually... So it's slowly coming up until eventually it passes that event horizon. And when it does, the light from the extreme extremities of the universe has arrived. So on day four of creation, billions of years of light years have passed away from the earth. But on the earth, it's been just one day. <sighs> I don't know how well I've explained that, guys. It's mind blowing, I know, but um, I was given the challenge. I accepted the challenge. Um, if you want to know more about this, the video we've got on this is just astonishing. It really is. Um, okay. Uh, the other thing I would point out, um, uh, evolutionists will tell us that the Earth is not at the center of the universe. Uh, because if, if the Earth was at the center of the universe, that would imply that it's in a special place. 
And these, guys, these people don't want to think that the Earth is in the special place. But there's now some very good evidence that scientists have found that the Earth is at or very close to the center of the universe, which is why this, this theory actually works quite well. Whew. Okay, you know what, I'm running out of time. I'm going to very quickly, one of the things that happens at a meeting like this, I'm the only person that's here, and after, after the meeting, people come up to the table and, and they'll ask questions. And I don't like questions, but I get questions like, okay, um, what would you recommend if I'm interested in, and then you, they fill in the, the blank there, okay? So I'm going to answer a couple of those questions now. If you're looking for a general overview, I would recommend this book. It's called The Creation Answers Book. It has answers to over 60 of the most asked questions on creation, evolution, and the Bible. And you can actually get this book for free if you want. Um, we have it in an intro pack. Yep, oh, sorry, back one. <laughs> actually, we've done really well. Uh, can you like, give the man a, a round of applause at the back there, because he's done remarkably well. <laughs> The intro pack's got um, Refuting Evolution, which apparently is the best-selling creation book of all time, uh, apart from the Bible, of course, uh, Origin of the Modern World, and we throw in the, um, the answers book free of charge. I'm going to race through the next because I, I don't have time to go through them. So if you go through that one, through the next one, through the next one, we've got books on all these different topics, guys. Just come and see me and we can talk about it. Dinosaurs, yes. Uh, this is a new book we've just released called Titans of the Earth, Sea, and Air. It is the go-to book for explaining dinosaurs from a biblical perspective. Um, um, and this, this one is really great for you young people, okay? This book is $5. It's called The Creation Survival Guide, and it's designed to help young people navigate the difficult school and university years and come out the other end with their faith intact. Okay, I want to finish by rounding it all off. I want to return to those three big questions that we considered at the beginning. Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? And remember how I told you that the answer to questions two and three will always be dependent on how you answer question one. If the Bible is correct in what it tells us about question one, that we were deliberately designed, created by an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God, then surely it's only sensible that we would look to the Bible for answers to questions two and three. So, regarding the question, why am I here? The Bible's been described as a love letter from God. All the way through, we, he tells us that he created us to be the recipients of that love and that we are designed to love him back, to know him intimately, and to live a life of purpose, fulfillment, and excited, excitement. <laughs> and what about that last question? Where do we go when we die? The Bible gives us a very good answer to that question as well. Remember how good the world was uh, before the entry of death and suffering through Adam's rebellion and sin? God promises a restoration to a similar state, but this time it will be even better. The complete removal of all pain, suffering, disease and death in, place, in, <clears throat> in a place of intense joy and peace in his close presence forever. You know what? Adam and Eve had a choice. They could either obey God and live forever in a perfectly good creation, or they could reject him and experience a future of pain and suffering that was never intended for them. And we all face that same cho choice today. I have one final thought. We have so much information today, more information than at any time in church history. People don't get to hear it because creation is not allowed in the secular realm. 1 Peter 3.15 tells us to be ready always to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that is in you. And the next verse says, but do this with gentleness and respect. Remember, you and I can't save anyone, but we are called to be faithful witnesses. Thank you. Um, it's been an absolute blessing, uh, and God bless you all.